<laughs> it's a staff. All right. Um, hopefully you had a chance. Well, hopefully you had a chance to review the diabetes lecture. Of course, you you know you have till the exam to go through the material if you haven't yet. But it should help you with what you're going through with other classes right now. Um, and I just wanted to go through a couple of cases and talk about um, just some scenarios because I know that the way I presented it, the guidelines are not necessarily all over the place, but there's a little bit of differences. So I just want to reiterate what I'd be looking for in an exam scenario and what kind of the, the way I'm going to tailor my questions and uh, approach the, the questions you could expect on the exam. So, okay, so this would be a uh, type one case we're going to look at here. So um, this was something that actually happened to me. So I, I thought it was so interesting that I wrote up a case in 2015 and then ended up using it in class. So anyway, this was an 88-year-old female who came into our emergency department uh, because she had an insulin pump that malfunctioned. Um, so the question is, when you have patients like this uh, who you're managing, you know, you could be working with specifically type 1 patients, and so you might know a lot about insulin pumps. But if you're working in urgent care, ED care, primary care, you might end up in a scenario where you have a patient with a malfunctional pump. They don't necessarily know who to call or they can't get a hold of whoever their primary doctor is, and they might end up in, in your ER, your urgent care, or wherever you may be. So the um, question is, you know, what, what do you want to know immediately? Do you guys have any questions? If you had a patient who came in with an insulin pump malfunction, what are some of the things you'd think about right off the bat? That's blood sugar. That's blood sugar, sure, sure. She was, she was actually doing okay. I think it was like normal. It was like 105 or something. I'll say that. So um, her blood sugar was good. Any other things you want to know? Yeah, exactly. So she's type 1 or type 1? 2. She was actually type 1. Yeah, how or when, Tyson? No, like when. When, like, yeah. When do you actually do? So what do you actually do in a situation like this? That's a great question. So um, most pumps, a lot of pumps are manufactured by Medtronic, but there's a couple different companies that make them. This was a Medtronic one. She was able to call Medtronic, and they were able to um, kind of troubleshoot it over the phone with her uh, before she came in. And they instructed her to come into the ER because they weren't going to get her a new pump in time. This was on a Sunday or a Saturday night. I think it was a Sunday night. So of course, probably the worst time, <laughs> one of the worst times you could think about is a weekend evening to go into a situation like this where you're pretty much stuck until you can get to a weekday where they can actually drop ship you the pump um, quickly. So she's getting a new pump in route. Now the question is, what exactly do we do? So um, I did some digging in her notes, and let me change it on this one too. Uh, and then I found that she had some encounters in her chart. So she's following with a lineup for her insulin management, their type 1 diabetes management, and you can see her uh, settings here. So um, the pump types on there, the type of insulin she was using, her basal units, and when they change rates uh, and what time intervals they do were all on there. So you know, the point is I'm not going to you know, give you this information on the exam and make you add it up, although that would be really interesting. Uh, not for you, for me. Uh, you guys would probably all just skip that question. <laughs> uh, but you can see basically what she would be doing and how much approximately she would be using. So, and, and if you didn't really want to do math, you can actually look at the bottom. It says total daily dose 18.8 plus or minus 1.2 units and what percentage of basal versus bolus she's getting. So, that actually gives you a pretty good frame into how you might dose her. Like, let's say you wanted to give her some injectable insulin, some insulin pens or vials or whatever it may be. In the meantime, you could uh, use that as sort of a frame of reference for how much she's getting in her pump. Um, so general solution, the question would be is that do you go with an easy versus complicated route? So complicated, you could figure out, okay, she's using whatever percentage of her basal, so maybe I'm going to give her some insulin glargine or Lantus, and then we're going to... Uh, calculate how much that's going to be and then add mealtime insulin in. Um, but uh, that gets a little tricky. You're giving the patient a bunch of medication that they're only going to be using for about a day, so there's some cost needed to consider there. We ended up um, just giving her an injection of uh, Lantus in our ER and then discharged her with, uh, with the Lantus pen to do a dose the next day as well. We figured just the basal would be enough to get her through. It was an evening, so I think she had eaten her last meal. Uh, she would have a meal the next day, but her sugars were so in range, we didn't think it was you know, paramount that she needed to be managing her mealtime insulin at this point. So just an example of a way to troubleshoot this, and I don't think you need to, I guess the question is, when's a patient going to get the pump, and if they're going to get it within a reasonable time frame, I don't think you really need to get all complicated with these people, and giving them potentially hypoglycemic would be, of course, the biggest concern here. 
Other scenarios, so if her blood sugar was over 500 upon admission, um, you can review some of the slides if you haven't, but that would put her in a bit of a potentially ketoacidosis situation, not necessarily just blood sugar alone, but something you definitely want to keep on your differential diagnosis. And then um, if she couldn't get her new pump for two weeks, and that'd be, uh, you probably recommend maybe going with a different company if they can't replace her pump for two weeks. But <laughs> in, in that case, you would really want to make sure you have a, a more specific regimen in place. So you look at how she was carb counting, so you can go back and look at the um, one unit per 23 grams of carbohydrates at 24 hours, and then calculate her basal and bolus out a little bit more uh, specifically to be able to give her a better regimen there. But in this case, we just went with basal insulin. And as far as I know, it worked out. I guess that's the beauty of emergency medicine. You don't necessarily see, <laughs> see what your <laughs> interventions do. The beauty and the fly, I should say, right? <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah. yeah. What was the incident for? So what if the blood glucose was over 500? Is that just like fluids and insulin? Yeah, basically. Yep. So you'd probably, you'd, you'd want, yeah, that's a good yeah. question. I should elaborate more on that. So you'd want to make sure you're, you're treating whatever symptoms she might be having. You know, she's symptomatic. It's, you got to give her something. Can you discharge her? Is she stable enough? Maybe give her a dose of something short-acting, either regular insulin or you could give um, like a Novolog or, or an Aspart or something like that. And then reassess her at the appropriate intervals. If she comes down, okay, maybe discharge her. If she's not coming down, you can consider like an overnight observation or something like that. If she's really unstable, I mean, she is 88, so things are really out of whack. She might be an ops case anyway if her blood sugars were really out of whack. Probably be a good idea. All right, so moving on, let's talk about some other just random questions and discuss some different scenarios. So uh, diabetes question one. So let's say you have a following medication regimen for a newly diagnosed type 1 diabetic patient. So what, can you rule out any ones right away? A. A, yes. All right. Good. Never use oral medications in a type 1 diabetic patient, so we can get that out of the way right away. Any other ones that don't look very effective? B, yeah. So B, even if you're giving clarity, still metformin has no role in type 1 management. So A and B we've ruled out. I hear some, some people mumbling C. Why is D incorrect? You guys know what D is? You haven't memorized all the directions. <laughs> oh, yeah. D is incorrect, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that C will work. <laughs> yeah. D is a, uh, um, a glucagon-like peptide agonist. So it's a uh, type 2 management only. Um, so C would be the correct answer. Of course, glargine being your basal and aspart being your meal time. Um, yeah. One more time, why was B incorrect? Because it has metformin in it. You wouldn't have any reason to give somebody metformin. All right, so here's a case. So this is a type 2 patient. Um, got MT, 46 year old male. He's hypertensive and has type 2 diabetes. He's been diagnosed recently, started on metformin. Additionally, been working on improving diet, exercising more. After five months of these changes, A1C is still 8.7%. Uh, what would you do for MT, and what more information would you like to know? So the way I'm going to phrase these questions so we can talk about them a little bit more, but I'd give you a little bit more information. So my goal is with, with the different guidelines, uh, like I said in the recorded lecture, I don't think they necessarily conflict with each other. I think it's all about patient-specific. So what might lead you down the path of picking one of these drugs? So let's talk about choice A first, basal insulin. Um, where did I say, or what do you guys know about starting somebody on basal insulin and adding that right onto metformin? So metformin is pretty much first line for all the guidelines. Everybody agrees with that. And so the next steps is where things get really fuzzy. Above nine. Yeah, above nine. Um, I think ADA maybe says a little bit higher, but yeah, that would be the A. Is it what is it the Endocrinology College, I can never remember their acronym. Uh, but yeah, they say about 9% you would consider. So he's not quite there. Um, they also say that if you get just have a patient right off the bat, too. So let's say he was brand new and was on metformin, um, and he was like 10 to 12%. That'd be a, a candidate probably to start on insulin right away. You just can't get great A1C reduction with oral meds alone. And you can stack up a bunch of oral meds, but the most you might get is maybe 3 to 4% reduction. So if you have somebody at 12%, 
they're really never going to hit their goal with even if you give them triple therapy unless they respond really well, which is possible, but uh, would be unusual. Uh, what about can a glyph close in? Yep, good, very good. So you'd want to know his creatinine clearance. So if I gave you a patient with compromised renal function, or if I said moderate kidney disease, that'd be a pretty big red flag for those medications. Uh, most of them don't recommend using if your creatinine clearance is under 60, and um, there's one which I don't think is that one, but there is one that recommends you can maybe use it with caution if it's between 45 and 60, but they're pretty much universal and under 30, they're contraindicated. So one, they don't really get to the site of action, they have to get to the kidneys and they have to filter it through to be effective. And two, they can accumulate less side effects. Uh, all right, what about glipizide? Anything that might tip you off to, to being a problem for using the sulfonylurea? What's their biggest side effect? <laughs> That's one of them. Hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia, yeah. So, uh, hypoglycemia is always something you want to consider and be concerned about with patients who have unusual meal habits. So if somebody's missing meals um, or exercising substantially, is maybe they're you know trying to lose a lot of weight, so they're starting a really intense exercise regimen. That's a person you might be concerned about glipizide on. And if they could stand to lose some weight, I didn't give you a BMI or anything like that. But if I said he was obese and I said he was a truck driver and misses meals regularly, something like that, those are some red flags for using uh, not using cell phone areas. Remember the. That's one of the biggest guideline differences between ADA and endocrinologists is that they they don't endocrinologists pretty much hate sulfonylureas and uh, ADA still recognizes them as a, a reasonable therapy. So I think they have a role in therapy and I think they will for a while because they're really cheap and they're effective. So whether or not you know you can argue diabetic pathophysiology theory, but they aren't going away anytime soon and they're still really commonly taken. So. And D, I think we can all agree that A1C is not a goal for this patient, so that's a throwaway one there. So what would be our answer? Um, the answer <laughs> depends on which other pieces of information you gave you. So I didn't give you a specific <laughs> enough to give you an answer, so I kind of tricked you on this one. The point is, is that we can talk through these things, and um, if I gave you, so again, like let's say his A1C was 9, that would maybe be a, a giveaway for insulin. If, he, if I gave you more information about his diet and exercise, maybe that would be a glipizide. Um, rule out. If I gave you this patient and told you is, he had some diminished renal function, you know, so I'm going to give you that information to drive your decision making. That's why I wanted to talk about each one instead of just giving you kind of a blanket scenario. Sorry, no, no technical correct answer. Yes. For the Anna, that one. Yes. Uh, is there SGF. is there like a, a creatinine clearance cutoff where? Above this is okay. Yeah, above 60 is okay. 60. Pretty much universally okay. Think about young patients that don't have a lot of complications being good candidates for those medications. Okay, but anything like pretty much normal. Yep, yeah. yeah. If I give you moderate ESRD or yeah, end stage for sure would be problematic or mild to moderate. Let's just say for the purpose of my exam, anybody with any renal insufficiency would be okay. contraindicated for those drugs. A question about the, the type two. Yep. So. Um, with the exception of the, of the biologics, of the glucagon and the peptide, are all of those PO uh, administered? Yes. Yes. Yep. Those are the only ones that are injectable. Correct. Okay. Because I noticed that there wasn't any like, I don't know, the slide that it's either the PO or the dosages, like, but we. Yeah. Know yeah I won't test you on any dosages. So it's, it's too many medications to know. And, but yeah. PO on every type two except for the glucagon. Yep. Except for the GLPs. Yeah. Okay. And of course, insulin. Enjoy. All right. Any other general diabetes questions before we go into thyroid disorders? <laughs> All right. Could you clarify what um, low A1C is? Is that seven? Yeah, it depends on the guideline you look at. It could be six point five. Could be seven. Um, I'm trying to think of if I'll give you a scenario where you would need to really know anything other than maybe that like really high end cutoff. Yeah, I, I I could give you. I would say let's say seven for the purpose of my exam. Yeah, we'll say seven. That's an easy cutoff. 
it does depend on age, and yeah, you can debate that, but seven's pretty average. All right, so hypothyroidism. Um, I listed the, the symptoms here, so it's sort of got a, a pretty standard approach, but it could, you know, depending on what the patient is presenting with, they could be showing any number of symptoms, like, in, for example, if they're having psychiatric symptoms, that could really override a lot of the other presentation, too. So there's, there's a lot to think about with this, and it can affect a ton of different systems. So um, we get concerned about a number of things, but uh, people tend to just be uh, present usually with um, some weight gain, uh, cold intolerance seems to be kind of the early onset things, dry skin, and then you might see some cardiovascular complications too starting early on as well. But um, hopefully they won't get to the point where they're exhibiting schizophrenia and tell you. You should be able to manage them before that theoretically. Okay, so um, you have a couple different hormones we're talking about here. Thyrotropin-releasing hormone, um, thyroid-stimulating hormone, and then your T3s and T4s. So T3 and T4 are two different forms of active um, thyroid hormone, and they both work similarly. There's a couple of differences. T3 is a lot more potent than T4, um, and T4 actually gets converted into T3 in the blood, not within the thyroid, but in the blood. So it's kind of confusing because of the numbers, I think, but just remember T4 is the slower one. There's usually more of it in some person's body, like if you measure serum concentrations. You don't generally measure T3. Um, and uh, it's not a very useful uh, treatment at all. We have some synthetic T3 option, but we don't use it very often. Mostly we're targeting T4. Um, so the thing to remember about labs is that when you're treating somebody's thyroid, or somebody is um, having a, uh, a situation where they're hypothyroid, they're going to have a really high TSH level. The reason being is because their thyroid is not kicking out as much active T3 or T4, and so your body upregulates TSH production to help boost the thyroid into producing more. So that's our major biomarker we're measuring here. So um, well, basically, when you look at it, I'm going to talk about dosing strategy a little bit because it's really important. There's really only one medication we use for this, um, but uh, the dosing can be really all over the place depending on um, how the patient's responding. So TSH and T4 levels are really important to follow. Uh, this just talks about the, the di dietary iodine has some, some feedback uh, or some feedback that comes into play too. We'll talk about that a little bit during thyroid storm and some other things too, but it's just on here for your reference if you want it. Yeah. How do they also measure thyroglobulin? Like, have you ever seen that? I'm not sure what thyroglobulin is. I don't think they're talking. You talk to an endocrinologist, they, they should okay. know. <laughs> I'll pump that one. Okay, so this is a, once somebody develops this, it's going to be a permanent lifelong condition. It's really common. Um, levothyroxine, or, which is basically synthetic T4, the drug we use, is one of the most common prescriptions. It's always on like number one list. And there's some debate on what the most common prescription in the world is, but most, or in US is, but um, for chronic disease, it is levothyroxine. Because you think about, you know, disease like hypertension, yeah, there might be more people with it, but there's a ton of drugs to treat it, whereas you have a disease like hypoactive thyroid, there's really only one drug. So everybody's on pretty much the same thing. Um, it's more common uh, in older women, and uh, generally speaking, if you, when you look at the general population, though, if you look at younger populations too, it's more common in men than women. Um, therapy is relatively straightforward. You're basically missing a hormone, you need to replace it. Um, your goal is to restore normal thyroid function, and then your symptoms should resolve after that. And we replace that with an oral T for uh, synthetic supplement. Uh, and again, I talked about the TSH and, uh, and how that comes into play there. These are just some, some factors that might change requirements. So people might temporarily become hypothyroid because their body has a sudden increase in um, need for T4, and then their thyroid can't keep up. So usually the body equilibrates pretty well, but there might be times when you end up with some of these conditions. Um, there are some medications that can cause increased metabolism of T4, a lot of them are a standard enzyme inducer, so think about drugs like phenytoin and phenobarbital and carbamazepine are all anti-epileptic drugs. Not super common medications, but still used. Um, those can help. Uh, those can help process T4 more, leading to the disease to be uh, further progressed in patients. So there's some things that can cause malabsorption um, or increased excretion too, which can impair uh, some of the issue, some of the uh, T4 uh, levels as well. 
All right, so our brand names, um, Synthroid has been the, the oldest brand name. It's probably the one people use commonly a lot. Um, there's a number of different brand names out there for levothyroxine, though. And it's a little bit controversial because um, a lot of people won't want you to switch between brands. So let's say uh, you, you have a patient who's always been on Synthroid, and there's a generic version of levothyroxine that's less expensive, uh, but they try it and their TSH levels get out of whack even though they're on the same dose. So remember there is dose-to-dose -dose variability. There's maybe up to 10% variability. So if you get the same person a 50 microgram tablet, somebody might be getting 40, you know, 45 micrograms, somebody might be getting 52 micrograms. You don't really know exactly. The, the company just hopefully is right on that specification, but you can't prove that, and the company just to be within FDA specifications has to be within a range. Um, so in most cases, it doesn't matter. In this case, you might see people with just subtle variations might be enough to throw them for a loop with their disease. So usually people will stick to the, the brand that they start on. Now, we have, I think at our hospital, we stock Synthroid, and we pretty much just replace everyone with that. I don't think there's a huge issue with it, but every once in a while that might come up. Um, so levothyroxine, again, synthetic T4. It's absorbed very well from the GI tract, um, and then it will get converted to three, T3 at certain ratios, but T4 is active too. Um, it's a once daily dose. It has about a six to seven day half-life. Um, so there is actually some interesting evidence out there that says it's somewhat newer that says you can dose patients once weekly or even a couple times a week. Now, I'm always of the mindset that once daily is easier to take than a once weekly medication from a memory perspective, but some patients might like once weekly. So you can actually give somebody's whole dose one time once a week. And um, there's evidence to support that that works just as well with minimal side effects. So um, keep that in the back of your head if you have a compliant patient, patient with compliant issues that um, might benefit from that. The dosing spectrum is uh, anywhere from 25 micrograms to 300 micrograms. So it comes in a really wide spectrum. And you'll see patients mixing and matching different doses to titrate in to the one that works for them. So you might see a patient even take like 100 micrograms one day and then like 150 the next day and they might actually alternate throughout their week. So again, if you have a patient that you're doing that on, maybe it does make more sense to take everything at once in the beginning of the week instead of trying to remember to alternate doses. So um, it's not super common, but I do see it enough where it's not like I get surprised by it anymore. It's a really common, uh, again, very common medication. Um, there's an IV form available too, so if people are NPO, we can do it. However, it's about um, twice as potent, so we give it at half the dose. So that's a good thing to remember if you're ever working in critical care or any area where you're um, working with a lot of patients who can't tolerate oral medications, that you're going to keep them on their levothyroxine usually, but you're going to give it at half the dose. So how do we dose this? So um, for the most part, you're looking at uh, kind of a standard weight-based dosing as your target dose more or less, although it gets a little bit confusing. So for a younger, maybe healthier patient who's hypothyroid, 1.6 mic per kilo per day, which if you look at a 70 kilo adult, it's 112. So if you're wondering why they have really weird dosing intervals, like the 88 to 112, it's because of the mic per kilo recommendations and the standard weights of people. You know, it doesn't really make sense in the long run, but they do have these weird like 88 and 112s. Um, older adults, if you have somebody elderly or even um, you know, moderately elderly, I would say be much more conservative than that. I wouldn't necessarily hit somebody really hard with a heavy dose right off the bat. It can put people into possibly a mildly hyperthyroid state initially, which can cause some tachycardia and some cardiovascular effects. Hopefully it'll be short-lived as the body gets used to it. But in an older adult, especially one day with some CV disease, I'd be careful. And in those patients, we usually just titrate up. So we might start them at 25 or 50 micrograms a day and just work our way up slowly. Uh, whereas with a younger patient, you could maybe start them at 100 or something, a little bit higher. Um, I do see patients every once in a while on like 200 or 300 a day, and it doesn't necessarily always seem size dependent. You'd think it might be, but it isn't. And uh, so don't be surprised. It's kind of I kind of think of this like almost like warfarin. When we talk about warfarin, there's not necessarily a, a science to dosing it. Everybody responds a little bit differently. I feel like this is very similar. You'll see doses really all over the place, and Again, while weight has some predictor, it's not always uh, a firm in, uh, indicator of what you're going to be dosing the patient with. Um, let's see. Again, we talked about once daily versus less frequent. Take on an empty stomach. So before breakfast, it absorbs best if there's not a meal on board. Uh, so people are supposed to take this before their first food of the day. Um, usually you're looking at about two weeks of use before you see some 
decent symptomatic improvement. Some patients it might take up to several months. And usually that's because you might have difficulty titrating and nail, dialing in that dose to, to really get it to the point where the patient's responding. And really, if somebody's failing initially, you're going to be increasing the dose until their labs work out. And if their labs end up looking good and they're on a decent dose, and um, you might be kind of stuck at that point. So we'll talk about how we might augment that with some T3 therapy, but that's an unusual situation. Usually, you can treat this pretty effectively with just the, the single drug as long as you're looking at your labs and treating your patient's symptoms and uh, titrating your dose appropriately. Is there any ceiling dose on this? I don't know if there is a ceiling dose. Um, I know I see patients on like 300 a day. I don't know if people cap out at a certain point or if they just try it and then they get to a point where they consider it to be a failure at that time. I'm not sure that's a good question. Okay, so once somebody has their dose established, you're looking at about a once a yearly TSH value. So once they're stable, you really just need to check once a year. Um, again, the, the factors, like, like I listed on slide, slide six, any of those things come into play, you might want to check more frequently. If somebody gets pregnant, definitely check it, make sure it's staying stable. Uh, long-term therapy is really highly effective at suppressing this. There's really no long-term side effects to replacing T4 synthetically. It seems to work quite well, and people don't tend to like, it doesn't tend to have like a tachyphylactic effect at all, so it seems to have a nice sustained effect on patients. Um, side effects mostly have to do with accidental or Un, I shouldn't say unintentional, but like unintentional, but uh, maybe poor monitoring where you end up with somebody who takes way too much and then they end up hyperthyroid. That's usually the, the most significant side effect people see. And then, of course, at the beginning of therapy, when their body's getting used to having low levels of T4 and then all of a sudden you're replacing it, they're going to have some fluctuations there, but their body should get used to that eventually and those should go away. And we'll talk about hyperthyroid in a few slides here. Uh, Lyothyronine is Cytomel is the brand name. It's synthetic T3. We don't really use it at all outside of mental health. So talk about this during depression very briefly when we get to psych, but um, this medication is used for um, hypothyroid patients who also have depression. It's thought to just be a more potent version of, of, of the thyroid hormones, and it gets a little bit more of a result in depression, whereas T4 doesn't seem to have the same result. It's kind of odd, but that's just where, where it was studied. So. Um, we see it a lot more, and if you work in mental health, you'll see this drug quite a bit more than if you work like with your standard primary care patients. Um, the problem with uh, lyothyronine is if you're supplementing it for um, hypothyroid, you can't measure T4 as your biomarker, and T3 fluctuates so much in the body that's not really a very helpful biomarker to measure. Uh, so really, you can still measure TSH, but your T4 measurements aren't going to be helpful. So that's another problem that is a nice diagnostic or a nice biomarker to look at to see how well you're, you're treating the patient that you can't rely on. Um, so where would we might use this? Again, if, kind of what I alluded to earlier, if you have a patient with normal TSH, normal T4 levels, and they're on levothyroxine, and for some reason they still aren't responding, you're still symptomatic, that's where you'd consider maybe supplementing with some T3. Uh, the dosing's not quite as um, strict as the T4 dosing, so it's not weight-based, it's not specific regimented, it would be more starting them on a low dose and just titrating them up and seeing if you get a response. And then, you know, if it doesn't work, that, that would be pretty much the end of the line. There's not a lot more you can do that is medication-based, I should say. There might be surgical options or other things like that, but as far as medications, that's really all we have. Again, most patients respond really well to T4, but you might get the odd patient that doesn't. Um, the other product I'll just mention really briefly is called Armor Thyroid. It's, a, it's an older medication that's actually made, made from desiccated thyroid glands from cows and pigs. Um, you might get some people who want this product, and I've heard this in real life before because it's quote unquote natural, comes from a natural source, it's not synthetic. Um, it's mostly T4, but there is some T3 in it, and who knows what else is in it because of the, the source of it. Um, it's dosed in grains, which is interesting. It's kind of the old way they used to measure things before metric system got a wide adapted. So grain, one grain is about 60 milligrams. So if you want to see that, it usually has it both ways on the bottle. Um, so if you're looking at dosing people, like uh, a trial would show that a standard one grain is about 88 micrograms equivalent of T4. So you get uh, an interesting combination of T3 and T4. So while the T4 concentration is quite a bit lower, you end up with T3 concentration that, remember, is quite a bit more potent than T4, so it ends up working itself out. So uh, it's 
it's a little bit tricky to dose it properly, I think. And there's not as many, not a wide variety of doses like there is with the T4 pods. There's like two or three available. Uh, the only people I see this are older generations who started on it, did okay, and are still on it. I don't really see people starting this as a new therapy. Um, some people might report it's less expensive. I've heard that too, that they can afford this because they pay out of pocket. However, in my experience, it's actually more expensive because it's kind of an unusual product, and the, the synthetic T4 products are relatively cheap, especially if you get certain generic manufacturers of it. So I don't know. It's, it's an unusual product to see, but you might see it occasionally. All right, so the treatment summary here is very straightforward. It's just T4 product. You want to titrate your dose appropriately. If you aren't responding, their labs look good. You would add maybe some T3 and see if you can get some response. So that's really all there is to it. Not too complicated. And I'm not going to ask you dose questions. I'm not going to test you on mic per kilo or anything like that. I just kind of want you to know how I might give you a patient who starts on something and give you titrate dose as an option or something like that. I'm not going to actually ask you dosing questions. All right, any questions on hypo before we talk about hyperthyroid? Can you get off of these medications and be okay? Can you what? Can you get off of the medications and be okay? Likely not. Yeah, you're going to have to supplement the thyroid somehow. Um, and if I, I don't know if I've ever heard of somebody whose thyroid starts to spontaneously start making T4 again, and you really can't sustain. I mean, you're going to be pretty miserable if you're hypothyroid. Um, so question is quality of life. If somebody wants to trial off of it, you could maybe do it. I wouldn't recommend it though because I don't really know what benefit you'd get from doing that. I think once you get them to a good point on the medication, you just want to keep going. Most people don't, again, they're replacing the thyroid hormone appropriately. They should be symptom free. They shouldn't really notice anything because the medication doesn't have many side effects at all. Yeah. When you say the synthetic T3 for like just a natural response uh, issue that you're talking about, mm -hmm. would you see like thyroid problems? Yeah, potentially. Yeah, you could see some, um, because it's pretty short-lived, it's got a pretty short half-life, you might see like, well, we can talk about the side effects here. So, um, whoops, wrong way. So the biggest thing you're going to see probably that patients are going to notice right away are the CV-related side effects. So they might feel tachycardic and feel like a, or you might see blood pressure increases if you're monitoring that. Um, the other things they might see are weight, weight loss and muscle wasting. That's not going to be right away. So usually if you give them a dose of T3 and they're already maybe, maybe they're even high thyroid or if they have a disease that's causing hyperthyroid, yeah, that'd be a patient you'd want to avoid it in. But it's something to watch out for and think about. It's, it's not, it's, there's some evidence to support it really pretty much using it in depression and um, it's not really common, but I do see patients okay. on it occasionally. So. But yeah, that's a good question. Uh, this just compares signs and symptoms if you want to review, but we'll keep going here. Uh, so causes of hyperactive thyroid. Um, there's a number of ways you can look at diagnosing this, and this isn't my expertise at all. But basically, if the thyroid gland has a normal or high amount of radioiodine uptake during imaging, it's probably one of these different sources. So autoimmune disease, um, some sort of a tumor usually would be the other other type. So Graves' disease is probably the more common autoimmune disease. Um, and then if the thyroid isn't taking up any iodine, you're looking at maybe some sort of uh, inflammatory process that damaged the thyroid. So either it could be previous radiation therapy from um, you know, cancer treatment, or uh, amiodarone is notorious for doing this over long term as well. It's a common side effect for long term amiodarone use. Um, excessive replacement therapy at, at inappropriate doses, unmonitored high doses, can also cause the thyroid to just be damaged to the point where it could it's inflamed, it doesn't really function anymore. Uh, all right, Gray's disease. Um, I put kind of the, the bulging eyes is one of the things that people associate with Gray's disease, and Missy Elliott actually has Gray's disease, so I've got our celebrity for the day up there. Uh, um, so antibodies, uh, basically this is a, an autoimmune disease, of course, it produces antibodies against the TSH receptors. And um, the treatment really is a couple different tiers. So you're looking at mostly symptomatic relief in the beginning. And so remember, tachycardia and increases in blood pressure are the two things that we want to control. Those are the things that are going to cause a lot of problems if we let those go long term. So the rest of the things, while they're annoying um, and probably uncomfortable for the patient, the, the cardiovascular focus of, of this disease is, is paramount, at least in the beginning. And it also should help with some of the heat intolerance and anxiety, too. So it should not only help with those direct um, things we can measure, but also some of the other symptoms that are occurring. 
Um, so beta blockers are a good bridge once somebody's diagnosed with this until you can figure out what else to do. And then we're going to use uh, drugs called thionamides, which um, are usually used for more moderate to severe disease. But people with graves will probably progress to that point at some time. So somebody is really mild graves, very early therapy. You don't necessarily have to do anything other than beta blockers if they're getting some minor symptoms. Uh, but you do want to have a plan in the back of your head for what to do if the disease progresses. Um, there is radioiodine therapy we can do in surgery. So really what we're looking at with all of our treatments is getting people to the point where we can get them some other intervention that's not medication. We can't do much to the, for this disease other than just bridge people to like a radiation therapy or a surgical intervention. All right, so our goal with our thionamide medications is uh, to attain a euthyroid state in three to eight weeks, and then usually following that with ablative therapy. Um, it can take uh, one to two years to achieve remission without any additional intervention. So if you're just trying to do this, you can end up with multiple cycles. Um, but most people can get to that point at, at, at a certain time. And so this would be a non, either radio or surgical, I guess. So it depends on which way you go. Um, the mechanism, so we're in, these drugs are going to inhibit synthesis of thyroid hormone by blocking oxidation of iodine in the thyroid gland. And this is going to limit your biosynthesis of T3 and T4. Important to note that circulating T3 and T4 are still functional. <clears throat> and while T3 tends to eliminate fast and, and get broken down fast, T4 tends to last quite a bit of time in the body. So that's why it's important that even if you undergo one of these medications, it's going to take a while to get to the point where you're stopping the biosynthesis altogether to a point where the patient's symptoms are managed. So that's why those beta blockers get, get really important, especially in early therapy. Um, methimazole is probably the preferred agent here. It's due to a long half-life. Um, and so it's a once-a-day dose medication. Um, and it also tends to work a little bit more quickly than the alternative, which is propylthiouracil. Um, PTU is, however, okay in pregnancy, whereas methimazole is teratogenic. So if you had a, a pregnant patient, that would be the drug of choice. Um, PTU, we're going to talk about its, its other use. It has a, a bit of a different mechanism, and uh, it comes in handy during thyroid storm, which we'll talk about here just briefly in a second. So before we get to that, let's talk about some other side effects. The side effects are, are not great, uh, at least the profile goes. You're looking at maybe minor things like itching and rashes to arthralgia, um, nausea and vomiting, and um, you can have some uh, blood dysphrasias too, specifically agranulocytosis. So every time we hear agranulocytosis, we get really nervous because um, the FDA doesn't like approving drugs that cause this. So agranulocytosis pretty much wipes out all your uh, neutrophils. Um, to the point where you're so immunocompromised that you, you could be in a devastating scenario with an uh, opportunistic infection. Um, and so it's a really rare occurrence with any medication that causes it, but if one does, we do want to take it seriously. So people are going to be monitored very closely, You're doing CBCs regularly, especially during those first two months. When something's, and hopefully the idea is that somebody's not on this medication for life. On it maybe for a few weeks, months, maybe a year if you're having issues with the radiotherapy or the intermittent surgical candidate or whatever it might be. But um, so hopefully you don't have to monitor them for life, but you are going to be monitoring it fairly closely. Um, you have some maybe hepatotoxicity and pancreatitis that can occur too, depending on which one you're taking. A little bit more common with uh, the different ones there. Um, iodine itself can be used, too, in certain situations. So iodine is going to block the release of T3 and T4 from the thyroid gland via negative, in, um, negative feedback. And uh, we don't really use iodine too much anymore. It doesn't have a huge role in basic Graves' disease or hyperthyroid. Uh, but for short-term use, you could try it. And there might be some patients that want to try this route. Maybe they you know, think that... You know, you get people who don't want to take a traditional medication and they think that this is more of a, uh, an, I don't know, a remedy or something that is more natural perhaps. And so you get patients who would prefer it that way. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just not as effective as the other medications. But um, so what's, what are the roles really? If you have a preoperative Graves patient, um, iodine will decrease thyroid vascularity, which can actually increase the risk of a thyroid storm. So it can be a real big problem prior to surgery. So we always make sure we stop it. Um, and if you are going to use iodine and something like methimazole too, you want to make sure that you start the methimazole before giving the iodine. The reason is, is because you want to shut off that release of T3 and T4, because if your body is still kicking that out, you can end up with a, um, uh, a 
massive increase in T3 and T4 from the iodine, so your body's just going to use it as a supplement. And uh, so make sure that you get that thionamide on board first. That's important. But iodine therapy is quite rare for um, anything other than maybe in thyroid storm. So thyroid storm is kind of what it sounds like. Basically, it's a really hyperactive thyroid. So think about all your hyperactive thyroid symptoms on steroids. And that's what thyroid storm is. The biggest problem, of course, is going to be the cardiovascular complications. So um, somebody with a really have, um, high increase in blood pressure, tachycardia, uh, of course, they're going to feel really uncomfortable and anxious, but that's going to put them at high risk for stroke and heart attack, and that's what's ultimately what could possibly kill them. Thyroid storm can be quite deadly if we don't treat it correctly. Um, so what we're going to do for patients is give them IV beta blockers right off the back, get that heart rate, blood pressure under control, metoprolol, labetalol, and esmolol all work great for those. Um, and then we do propylthiouracil in this patient. So in these patients, so every four hours you have to dose this, but um, it does block T4 to T3 conversion, which is a bit different of a mechanism. So methanosol doesn't really do that. Um, and in this case, it's really helpful because you aren't converting your remaining T4 into the more potent T3, which can really help control the thyroid storm. Um, you can add iodine to IV fluids to get that negative feedback going. Of course, you'd want to make sure your PTU is on board before you do that. Um, and then glucocorticoids can help too. Glucocorticoids through roundabout mechanism can actually reduce T4 to T3 conversion as well. So you get that benefit there. Um, and eventually you'd get your patient on methanazole once they stabilize. But this would be kind of your initial therapy that would be the, um, the acute phase and then you'd move to methanazole in the, the transitional phase there. Can you all four of those agents then at one time? Or you could. Depends on how severe it is. You're probably going to do your beta blockers and then your PTU. Um, the, the, the iodine and glucocorticoids, I'd say, would be less likely to be used. So um, most patients, because this is primarily symptom management, and then you, of course, want to control the underlying cause, but the PTU should do that. So really, you should be able to manage most patients with beta blockers and then the PTU. But if you need more help, you can use the other two. So yeah, somebody could theoretically be on all four, but it's not, not necessary in all cases. This is unusual. You don't see this very often, but I figure it's worth mentioning. All right, any questions about hyperthyroid before we move on to some other topics? Can I ask real quick? Yeah. Uh, when you said, like, on that previous slide, PTO every four hours, and then you can also add, like, IV iodine? Yeah, you basically put a few drops of iodine in somebody's IV fluids. So uh, remember, that's going to cause that negative feedback on the the hormone secretion, so you're not going to get as much TSH, you aren't going to get as much T3, T4 release ultimately from the iodine, but you need to make sure that your PTU is on board first because you have to shut down the production before you give them iodine, which is ultimately going to cause more production in a normal person. Okay. Makes sense. All right, uh, just very quickly talking about a couple other endocrine things. I don't have much more to say, and then we'll, we'll take a quick break and do the men's health topics. Um, a couple things we're going to mention here uh, and go through. There's a number of different things that the hypothalamus does. And we aren't going to talk about women's health until we get to the that section. There's a specific section I have in the summer where we'll go into a lot of detail on like contraceptives and hormone replacement therapy and all those things. So we aren't going to get into that today. Uh, but we'll talk about a couple other of these things really quickly. So these are really pituitary hypothalamus diseases. A lot of them aren't terribly common, so I don't really think it's worth spending a ton of time on, um, but we'll touch base on diabetes insipitus at least here. So diabetes insipitus is uh, a, deficiency, a deficiency in secretion of antidiuretic hormone. Um, it's idiopathic in some patients, and it also can be associated with autoimmune diseases, so we don't necessarily know the cause for sure. Um, there's also nephrogenic, which is related to different types of kidney diseases, and so that's where people have normal ADH secretion, for some reason, their kidneys are resistant to antidiuretic hormones, so they aren't processing or, or removing electrolytes like they should be, or, or they're doing it too well. <clears throat> uh, children can have a genetic mutation that causes this. Lithium is a psych medication that can um, cause this as well, and uh, hypercalcemia can put people into this state. You have to get really high calcium levels, but it can happen. Uh, people are going to present with uh, pretty similar, uh, that's why it's called diabetes, because the symptoms are very similar to what you'd expect from an onset of a type 1 or type 2 diabetic patient. Um, however, it has nothing to do with blood sugar. So uh, the treatment is really just desmopressin, which is a synthetic version of antidiuretic hormone. 
Uh, it comes in a number of different dosage forms. A lot of people take it as a nasal spray. It seems to absorb well that way. That's probably the most common. Um, low sodium and low protein diets can help too. Otherwise, people can get hypernatremic uh, in some cases. Um, and then other drugs, thiazide diuretics can help if the person's hypernatremic. Um, carbamazepine is an anti-epileptic drug that helps remove sodium as well in some cases. So those are just some things to, to consider with uh, diabetes insipidus. Um, SIADH, or syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone, is kind of the opposite. Um, you get impaired water excretion due to your inability to suppress your antidiuretic hormone, so which leads to hypovolemia, which causes um, hyponatremia as well because you're wasting a lot of sodium. Um, so the labs, you're going to see really high um, urine osmolality and sodium due to that increased solute. And the symptom, the treatment is exactly the same as hyponatremia like we talked about last fall. So I'm not going to go through it again. Basically, you're looking at sodium replacement, hypertonic if the person's symptomatic, and then the Baptin drugs if you need more than that. Yes, sir. Yeah, you either of these really mess up your electrolytes. Like, you have to... Uh... Follow the electrolyte? Yeah, well, on a regular basis. If they're yeah. controlled, like if you have a person who has one of these diseases and they seem to be stable on desmopressin, or maybe they your supplement, you're just giving them salt tablets at home or having them take a higher sodium diet, maybe they'll be okay. Uh, but yeah, if they're in a situation where they're hyponatremic, you definitely want to yeah. make sure that doesn't get worse. All right, that's it. Let's take a quick 10 minute break and then we'll do the men's health lecture. We should get done a little early today. All right, guys, let's keep going here. <clears throat> so I have one clarification to make. Sorry, I was confusing myself. This should read hypervolemia, which probably makes a lot more sense to you guys. And I changed it in the recording here. Um, so hypovolemia has changed to hypervolemia. And people with SIDH actually can be normal blood volume, too. Just you get end up with free water increasing and sodium excreting, which causes imbalances. All right. Hopefully that clarifies that a little bit. What did you change, Chad? Hypo to hypervolemia. But hypo. Sip, yeah, hypo, hyponatremia. Yep. So you still lose sodium. Yep. It's basically dilutional. Right. Right. All right. So. For men's health, there's some thyroid question reviews here. I know we just talked about this, so. Uh, uh, all right, so anyway, we'll go through them anyway. So LS, you got a 63-year-old female, presents to your clinic to go over labs that she had drawn last week. She has gained a substantial amount of weight in the past two years and reports feeling cold often. Most of her labs are normal, including her cholesterol and CBC panels. However, her thyroid panel is abnormal. Her TSH is high and her T4 is low. So what should we do? C. C. Excellent. C is correct. All right, uh, which of the following medications could be used to provide short-term, immediate, symptomatic relief of complications from Graves' disease? B, atenolol, correct. Just remember short-term, methimazole would be a more longer slash intermediate-term solution. Oh, cholesterol review questions, just what you guys wanted. Uh, all right, so let's do some statin review. Okay, which of these statins has the lowest potency or lowest LDL lowering potential? A. Yes, Pravastatin. Torvastatin and Rasuvastatin are high potency, and Simvastatin is kind of a medium high potency statin. And number two, which of these statins has a lower risk of myalgia and virtually no drug interactions to worry about? A. a same, same answer. Pravastatin. <laughs> Simvastatin has probably the most drug interactions to worry about. Rasuvastatin and Torvastatin are kind of in the middle. They have a few. Not quite as bad, but. All right. Anyway, on to androgens. These are kind of interesting topics, I think. So talk about testosterone first. Um, I, I listed out all this stuff here, but basically you've got a number of things that are causing feedback to various areas of the body, releasing testosterone, getting metabolized into DHT. So we're going to talk about a, a couple of these different pathways and how we can manipulate them. So let's first talk with just standard testosterone replacement therapy. Why would you just replace testosterone? Well, people might have a somewhat low testosterone level. Um, there is a condition called hypogonadism, which is can re basically is low T, and you can get a decrease in sperm production, so it can affect fertility. Um, a decrease in testosterone production in general, which is going to be what you're going to see as a laboratory biomarker. And uh, in boys, it can be delayed puberty. 
Um, testicular or pituitary disease can also cause um, low testosterone, so like testicular cancer or pituitary cancer as well. So those might be some, just some examples of clinical indications for replacing testosterone. Uh, mechanism, we're, basic, we're just giving a uh, replacement hormone via a number of different methods. I'll show you the different delivery methods here in a second for testosterone products. Um, and testosterone then can just bind, absorb into the blood and bind directly to androgen receptors like it would normally. It can get converted into DHT via uh, enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. So that's the more potent version of testosterone that works in a couple different areas. We'll talk about that in a second when we talk about uh, BPH. And I'll also be converted to estradiol by aromatase. So men do use estradiol for things. And so you get basically the missing link, and your body can use that like it would the endogenous hormone. Just as far as reference ranges, um, just for curiosity's sake, you can look at testosterone ranges kind of all over the place. So um, between 12 and 13 years and 14 years, it could be up to a certain amount, but usually it depends on if the child has hit puberty or not. And then 15 to 16 years, again, could be really on the low side, depending if they maybe haven't quite got there yet, and then could be quite high. And then for the rest of people, you see kind of a gradual decrease in that upper end as you're getting older. Um, and free testosterone is also something that could be measured too, which is uh, about 9 to 30 nanograms per deciliter, so quite a bit less. Testosterone is highly protein-bound, so um, the free amount is going to be very small compared to the total. All right, so clinical benefits of restoring testosterone. Virility. So uh, for people who don't have adequate sperm production due to low testosterone, you can restore that reproductive capability actually quite easily with testosterone replacement therapy. It's one of the easier cures for various types of infertility. We'll talk about infertility a little bit more detail during um, women's health and kind of the perinatal stuff. Uh, but this would be an easy fix for a man with low testosterone. Uh, muscle mass increase. So this is not necessarily a clinical reason to use it, but it's abused for this reason, of course. Uh, there's a lot of synthetic androgens, too, that have come on the market at various times for the purposes of um, being used to treat some of these diseases, like hypogonadism and other things like that. But um, really, we don't use them at all. We pretty much just stick to testosterone. So the, the synthetic ones tend to have a lot of side effects with them. They can, there is a couple, there's some, a group of them that cause pretty substantial hepatotoxicity and liver failure. However, they still are abused on the black market fairly frequently. So more, more thought of as like a catabolic steroid that people are going to inject for muscle mass increases. Um, bone density increase. So for, we talked a little bit about this during osteoporosis, but for men, if they have low testosterone and they're at risk for osteoporosis, it would be good to supplement it. Um, psychiatric effects. So this is controversial. As far as just improving mood, there's not really great consistent data on whether testosterone helps all that much. So if somebody has low testosterone and they're depressed, you could replace it and see, but I wouldn't count on it maybe having a lot of benefit. And um, for procognitive benefits for people with um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease uh, would be also not likely to be helpful. It's been studied in that area too for older men. Uh, it doesn't show any improvement or um, uh, prevention of decline into the disease. Delaying puberty, you, you could give to a boy who has secondary sex characteristics absent by the age at which 95% of peers would have initiated sexual maturation. So that's the criteria of what they would base that off of. Um, and then aging men, sexual dysfunction, depression, mood. So those are the more controversial things about giving people testosterone. I think there's a lot of obvious clinical indications for it, but then it's like you have an older man who is maybe on the lower end of the spectrum and just wants to take it because he wants to maybe build muscle or feel young again. I don't know. It's not necessarily the fountain of youth. I think people think it is. Not, not to say I've tried it, uh, but um, I think that people like, might expect a lot out of it. But if you're within that normal range, it's probably not worth replacing. Uh, but sometimes I think people will say, well, what are the real side effects to doing it? And um, that's a good question. So if you gave somebody who's within maybe on the lower end of normal range, what might you get? Well, you could end up with some different hair growth patterns. Um, aggression is kind of what you think of like roid rage. That would be something you might see too. Of course, that'd maybe be overdoing it a little bit. Um, we don't want to do that, of course. Um, increase in red blood cell production, which is generally beneficial, but if you overdo that too, you can end up with clotting risk. Um, different types of uh, effects on the male sex organs, of course, muscle mass and strength increase and bone density. So most of these things are good. However, um, really, you want to make sure if you're going to replace it, you don't want to uh, overdo it. So that's the big thing to make sure you're monitoring for it. That's why 
you know, I as a healthcare provider, it makes me worried that people abuse these products because they there's no way they can know how much they're giving themselves ad accurately without measuring it. Yeah. yeah. Do you know where they get the testosterone from? Because you know you get estrogen from the horse feed or whatever that is. Like, I think it's just synthetically produced, like we would produce, because the structure is very similar to like a corticosteroid. So I think they can just do a, a synthesize it in a lab for the most part. Yeah. And you can do that with this. There's a lot of synthetic estrogens and, and, and progesterones too on the market that are basically similar in structure. They just are slightly different. Uh, but testosterone, they seem to be able to synthesize the structure right on. And that's what they use. Uh, so uh, testosterone comes pretty much any way that's not oral. So testosterone is not orally bioavailable, uh, but it does come in a number of different preparations. Most of them are transdermal. So um, gels, creams, and patches are pretty common. This Androgel Pump is a really popular product. Um, the Depo Testosterone is like an every two week injection. That's a popular one too because it's really inexpensive. Whereas the Androgel brand name stuff can be quite a, quite pricey depending on if somebody has it. Uh, this product, Axion, is a like almost deodorant type thing. Is how it looks anyway, and it's designed for axillary. Um, I don't, I don't know who, who decided this was a good product to invent, but uh, I think the idea is that it's similar to putting on deodorant, so men might think about it that way and feel like it's easier to use. I don't know. But whatever. You're supposed to use it before your deodorant, just in case you're wondering, otherwise it's not going to absorb. Um, injectable, too. There's a couple implantable pellets and eye. So there's the IM Depo shot, which is just a, a depo, like a viscous oil that gets deposited in the muscle. And then absorbs. And then there's this. Um, if you're wondering why there's a butt on the screen, uh, this implantable pellet actually gets placed right here. Um, that's 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 where they put it. Um, and it's about the size. You can see it compared to a dime. So that's the size of it. So there you go. <laughs> All right, um, so problems, uh, contact, any topical product you're going to use, uh, you have risk of it rubbing off on something. So be careful like if you're giving it to somebody if they're, you know, to make sure they aren't coming in contact with women or children because it can have a pretty substantial effect. It absorbs transdermally, so if they rub it off on somebody else's skin, it's going to absorb into them too and can cause, of course, sometimes significant issues in those patients or in those uh, populations. Uh, most problems are due to overcorrection, so skin problems, CNS problems, um, endocrine can get out of whack. And basically the reason is why you might get gynecomastia and hair loss with uh, testosterone replacement overdone is because you're converting more into estradiol and that's causing those changes. Um, GI, diarrhea, GERD, uh, prostate specific antigen increase. We're going to talk about PSA and BPH, but that's the big biomarker and that can happen and get increased when there's too much DHT, which is a more potent metabolite of testosterone. And there's a number of other things too. Uh, so you're looking at this and you're like, why, why would anyone take this? Well, again, it's overcorrection. There's um, a lot of controversy about CV effects and testosterone. And it seems like I always read articles, but from what I've read, there's not really any substantial evidence to say that supplementing testosterone and targeting normal levels causes any increase in cardiovascular risk. I think most of it's found that the, the studies that have found that have been either um, not statistically significant or poorly done. So from what I understand, it's not a huge risk, or at least when we take all that seriously. All right, moving on to BPH. Any questions on just testosterone replacement before we move on? All right, BPH. So BPH is pretty much inevitable for any man as they age. It's, it's going to happen, and it's because DHT is a mediator of prostate growth. And so as you get more testosterone being metabolized and DHAs, DHT excuse me, over the course of a lifetime, your prostate increases. Um, and that leads to difficulty urinating. So how do we treat this? This is just a chart to show basically all men are going to get this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sorry, guys. <laughs> All right, so uh, I like this drawing because it shows all the different classes and it shows where they work. It's really nice. Um, so you have a couple different options. The two primary ones that we're going to talk about are going to be your alpha adrenergic receptors, so your alpha uh, blockers, and our 5-alpha reductase enzyme medications um, that work specifically on the prostate. Uh, and the alpha adrenergic receptors are also located in the neck of the bladder a little bit, so they'll help relax that and prevent as much contraction. So they're going to block alpha activity. Alpha, of course, is basically constricted in nature. Um, alpha receptors when they're triggered. 
Uh, phospholydiesterase enzymes type 5 are the same drugs we use for erectile dysfunction, which I'm going to talk about uh, at the end of the lecture. But um, like drugs like Viagra and Cialis, uh, Viagra doesn't really have the indication for it because it's got a short half-life. Cialis is a longer-acting drug, um, or Tadalafil is the generic name of it. And uh, it has been shown in lower doses, generally lower than they use for erectile dysfunction, that it actually works quite well for this. It has a number of different mechanisms that basically cause vasodilation um, and prevent uh, uh, the urine from being obstructed quite so much. Not going to have any effect on the actual size of a prostate. The only drug that does that is the 5-alpha reductase. And that prevents the conversion of testosterone to DHT. So that's the big change here. That, uh, that is going to actually help the prostate shrink and stop growing. So those drugs are almost essential. So what's the difference between dynamic and static fiber alcohol? Uh, that's a good question. Dynamic, well, let me think about this for a second. I didn't even look at that. Uh, <laughs> dynamic bladder outlet obstruction and static bladder. I think dynamic meaning that the, the bladder itself changes in size so the muscle contracts and expands. So uh, by manipulating this like with either a muscarinic medication or using alpha receptors on the bladder, you're changing the ability of the muscle to contract. Whereas the prostate's kind of just there, and you're basically just trying to shrink it over time. It's not going to change any muscle expansion. I think that's what they're getting at there. All right, so our alpha-1 antagonists, we've talked about these a bit, uh, talked about them during blood pressure a little bit, but um, there's kind of two groups you can break them into, and you can draw a line between doxazosin and tamsulosin if you want to. Um, terazosin and doxazosin are older drugs, more, uh, le I should say, less selective agents. Tamsulosin, alfluzosin, and psilodosin are all newer selective specifically for the bladder and the prostate. Um, these work quickly. They should work almost instantaneously to help men urinate better. Um, and uh, the one risk is that they cause a lot of orthostatic hypotension, especially the less selective ones. So um, the nice thing is, is that tamsulosin is generic. The other two newer ones, alfuzosin and psilodosin, I don't have the brand names on here, but they're um, both brand, uh, brand only, so they're quite expensive. But um, tamsulosin was Flomax, that was the brand name of it, and it's been generic for a little bit now. So you can get somebody a pretty affordable option that's also selective. So there's almost no reason to prescribe the other two, these two, unless you're trying to get blood pressure effects too. And in most cases, I would just avoid number one altogether. You're going to get the most, this is the least selective of the alpha antagonists, and it's going to cause the most orthostatic hypotension. Doxazosin will have a little bit more selectivity, but it also give you blood pressure benefits. So for a hypertensive man with BPH, that's a good choice. Just BPH you're trying to treat, stick to the tamsulosin. Um, and if that doesn't work, you can maybe try and get a prior authorization for one of the newer drugs, but uh, good luck with that. Uh, okay, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, there's two on the market, finasteride and dutasteride. Uh, finasteride is Proscar or Propecia. Proscar <coughs> is the brand name for um, BPH treatment. Propecia is the brand name for male pattern baldness, and the only difference is the dose. So it's 1 milligram for baldness, 5 milligrams for BPH. Um, same drug, same exact thing. So some people... Propecia was brand name for a while, so a lot of people would buy Proscar and cut it into quarters because it was generic and cheap and take that instead of to try and cheat the system that way. So uh, just FYI, you can do that. It's no problem. Um, what, they, what this drug is going to do is reduce the prostate gland over about 6 to 12 months, so it takes a while, which is why the alpha blockers are really helpful for that immediate uh, fast uh, result and symptomatic relief. Um, and again, limiting your conversion of testosterone to DHT, ultimately the prostate should shrink back to a normal size, or at least a more manageable size. Major side effect with this medication, uh, unfortunately, decreased libido and erectile dysfunction are the most common ones. And the reason is because is you're losing that really potent testosterone um, metabolic byproduct in DHT. Uh, so, <clears throat> so not all men get this. I mean, the incidence is probably, from what I've seen, like anywhere from 5 to 15%, depending on what study you look at. And um, dutasteride, I believe, has a bit lower incidence than finasteride. So if that's a big deal or if somebody starts on finasteride and experiences that, you could maybe switch them and see if they get a better result that way. But ultimately, these are the only drugs that are going to actually bring that prostate back to normal size. All right, so if somebody's mild to moderate, you don't necessarily have to start them on a 5-alpha reductase. You could just do some alpha blocker alone. Remember, this is going to happen eventually, so it's you're, you're not necessarily de delaying the inevitable. It's going to happen. It's not like you could give them drugs earlier to help them earlier because it's 
you might as well avoid the exposure to the medication as long as you can, I think, is more the, the, the general rule of thumb here. So use your alpha blockers to provide symptomatic relief. Once that starts maybe not happening or not working quite as well, um, symptoms get more severe, the prostate's really, really large to begin with, I would start combination therapy right off the bat. So you can combine your alpha blocker and your 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, no problem. Um, and then your other considerations too. So your anti-muscarinic drugs, which are mostly used for bladder control, could be used as an augmentative therapy for symptomatic relief. And your PDE5 inhibitors. I see, I feel like I see people on the PDE5 inhibitors more and more often for this indication. And it's funny because like I do a lot of medication intake for people getting admitted to the hospital. And when people are on that, they're, they're always really specific. Oh, I'm not taking that for erectile dysfunction. I'm taking it for ETH. I'm like, you don't need to tell me that. I'm not, I'm not judging you on what you're taking your medications for. I just want to know. Uh, so, and, you know, part of me wonders if maybe the added benefit of having the PDE5 inhibitor is why people are preferring that. But, you know, you never know. <laughs> that's just a theory. So, anyway, that's pretty much BPH. It's, it's pretty straightforward, I think, as far as the treatment goes. All right, um, I blew over the, the hormone-specific cancers, and I just want to touch base on prostate, and then I'll touch base on breast during women's health, just because they're the most common cancers we see. Um, so for men, uh, this is a really um, common cancer. It's something that uh, early diagnosis is key to survival. Tumor growth with prostate is quite slow, and metastatic spread is also slow. So if you catch it early, it's very treatable, which is good. Um, you're monitoring prostate-specific antigen, which is uh, something that is associated sometimes in most cases with potential for tumor development within the prostate gland. Um, high PSA doesn't necessarily always mean cancer, but it's usually correlated. So if somebody's tr being treated for prostate cancer, that's a biomarker you're going to follow to see how well the, um, the treatment's working. Um, a digital rectal exam, so actually feeling the prostate itself is uh, something that I think is standard on examinations in men over a certain age. I can't remember what the age cutoff is. Uh, but, you know, you could feel a tumor potentially that way. Um, BPH could be mistaken for a tumor, I think, if the prostate's really enlarged. So that's where you might need to do a biopsy or something like that. Um, it's important to know that BPH is not cancer and can't lead to cancer. However, you can have the two together at the same time. If you have an older man with prostate cancer, probably like this and BPH too. But BPH is not in and of itself cancer. And it's more common in older men than younger men. A couple different medications here. Androgen receptor antagonists. So you have um, drugs that basically are anti-androgens, flutamide, bicalutamide, are two examples of these, and they're going to inhibit androgen uptake and binding at target tissues. Um, a CYP17 inhibitor is an enzyme responsible for androgen biosynthesis. It's uh, one medication on the market right now. It's one of the newer therapies. It's $130 a pill, so that's a, a quite expensive one. It kind of falls into the category of really expensive chemotherapies. <clears throat> and then you have um, some other pretty common options that they'll give, and a lot of times this is for more severe disease. So it's basically medically castrating somebody so that the testicles aren't producing, test, test, uh, releasing or producing testosterone anymore. And um, there's a number of different medications, but let's we can take luprolide for a quick example and show you this drawing here. So gonadotropins would be like luteinizing hormone. Um, and so luprolide specifically is going to prevent the release of um, luteinizing hormone from the pituitary and that's going to prevent um, feed, back, feed into the testes, so they aren't going to get as much luteinizing hormone, therefore they aren't going to produce as much testosterone. So ultimately it's a form of medical castration. So not ideal for most people, but if you're looking at cancer, especially advanced cancer, it is an option for people. So it's a pretty common one. The Lupron shots are a depot, so they get like one shot every so often and it lasts a while. Um, with respect to test stuff for prostate. I'm not going to ask a lot of questions, and I'm going to keep things in classes. So don't you don't need to know any specific medications. Just know that you can use androgen receptor antagonists, a CYP17 inhibitor, or the um, gonadotropin uh, analogs or agonists that way. All right. No, you don't need to know specific drug names for those. I'll give you the classes. If you want to memorize them, you can, but all right, and then um, the sort of final topic, erectile dysfunction. So this is a really common, as you probably realize from the commercials that advertise these drugs like crazy. Um, and I was just doing a, a like a continuing education thing on this. And so um, depending on the study you read, it's up to an 18% uh, 
prevalence in men 20 or older at some point. So that doesn't mean chronic per se, uh, but people with chronic diseases, the prevalence increases dramatically. So it's about 50% of men with CV disease and diabetes are gonna report erectile dysfunction. Um, BPH and hypertension in general have a bit of a higher prevalence, but not quite as high as, as like something like heart failure, for example. Um, could be linked to a number of different things, decreased libido, premature, delayed ejaculation, can all kind of fit into the same category here. Um, if somebody's having decreased libido, which can cause ED, um, 5 to 15 percent of men at any given time, increased prevalence with age, uh, probably the most common cause you're going to see. Um, other common causes and treatment, psychological things can interfere with the erection process as well. So the question is you have to figure out if it's a purely psychological or if it's a physical cause. Because if somebody has obvious CV disease or diabetes, maybe that's of course a contributor, but if somebody doesn't, uh, maybe it's psychological or maybe they have early disease and you haven't necessarily been able to diagnose it yet. So there's always the question of somebody does, a man does report erectile dysfunction, they don't really have anything else going on, they probably need a workup for hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. Make sure those aren't contributing. And you can focus on the psychological part if you can rule other things out. Uh, we talked about low testosterone. Um, and then SSRIs are se selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the most common antidepressants used. So there's probably tens of millions of men in the country and world on these medications. Um, and their biggest side effect is decreased libido, both in men and women. Um, so, of course, you can get erectile dysfunction from these meds, and some of them have an incidence up to 30%. So it's a very common side effect and something to be aware of, and we can manage it with medications. If the depression's really well managed, you might want to try using some of the medications we're going to talk about. Um, you can also try switching to different antidepressants. We'll talk about that more during depression, how we switch, but just an important side effect to mention during this talk, I think. Okay, so um, underlying risk factors we talked about. There is some good data that shows that weight loss can help too. So they looked at men who didn't really have any other diseases other than just being maybe slightly overweight. Um, and they showed that a certain number of weight loss did drastically improve erectile function. Um, smoking cessation has also been shown to improve erectile function. Uh, medical therapy. So we have um, some straightforward working medications that we're going to talk about here in a second. And also I talked about side effects. The psych drugs are the biggest ones, and I've listed them there. Um, other things that people might not think about regularly are different things to treat blood pressure. So alpha blockers, beta blockers, thiazide diuretics, clonidine, spironolactone are all kind of common CV meds that uh, can also cause erectile dysfunction. Um, psychological, uh, psych concerns, anxiety related issues uh, to consider as well, and um, consider antidepressants or anxiolytics as needed. The, the of course, double-edged sword being that antidepressants can cause erectile dysfunction. So again, we'll talk about that during psych and how we walk that fine line. There are some that are much better than others. All right, so the drugs we've all been waiting for, the PDE5 inhibitors. Phosphodiesterase 5 is a mechanism of action that it's an interesting, I think it's kind of an interesting mechanism. So you don't take these medications and immediately get an erection. What happens is you augment the natural response to sexual stimulation. So the way things work in the brain is your brain gets, or somehow there's some something going on that's causing sexual stimulation. You get nitric oxide release, which is a vasodilator, um, which causes uh, guanyl cyclase to stimulate cyclic AM, GMP. Excuse me. You get calcium channel opening and uh, reduced concentrations as it flows out, which relaxes smooth muscles, causing blood flow. So that's all great, but what does PDE5 do? PDE5 breaks down that cyclic GMP. So what you get when you take a drug blocking that is you get that cyclic GMP that just hangs out, causing a more sustained effect, which is a more sustained vasodilation effect, which causes a more sustained erection. So that's basically the, the bottom line here. Now these drugs also, of course, we just talked about work for BPH. We use them for pulmonary hypertension too because they cause vasodilation in the pulmonary artery as well. So a couple different uses for them. But this is what they originally um, were marketed for. All right, there's four on the market right now. I put the three major ones on a, on the um, chart here, and then there's the newer one, uh, Avanafil or Stendra. Uh, so <clears throat> very, very similar. The biggest difference, I would say, is with Tadalafil, and that's with this half-life. So if you look at um, the duration of action, you've got three or four hours with Sildenafil or Viagra. Um, four to five with Cardenafil or Levitra, and then 17 and a half with Tadalafil. So it's a much longer acting medication. And of course, if you've ever seen a commercial for Cialis, they advertise it as once daily, you're ready to go anytime, right? So <laughs> you get that benefit from it. Um, and interestingly enough, there's a number of different things I put up there. I don't think any of them are, are 
terribly worth talking about here. Those costs are way wrong, by the way, now. I'll, I'll show you the cost in a second. It's way more expensive than that. Um, but what I would say is that if you look at comparison trials between them, there's not a ton of data out there. However, there was an interesting trial that looked at sildenafil and tadalafil as an open label crossover, meaning they had people do one drug and then cross do a washout period, cross over to the other drug, and then they basically asked them a bunch of questions. So um, the sildenafil, uh, or excuse me, the tadalafil group, um, or the, the men in the both groups preferred Tadalafil 71% over Sildenafil. However, there was no difference in actual reported outcomes that was statistically significant, with the exception of sexual intercourse to completion, which is very slightly higher in the Tadalafil group. So basically, men were reporting that both drugs were working, they just preferred Tadalafil overall. It's kind of interesting. Um, and then Stendra, is there any real market role for Stendra? I feel like you kind of forget about Vardenafil and Avanafil. You just pretty much think of Viagra and Cialis as the two major ones. Uh, but they claim that they get a bit better of an oral onset with it. However, there's no real proof of that. All of them theoretically could absorb in as quick as 15 minutes and start working. So. Uh, side effects. So, um, of course, vasodilation, so flushing, headache, dizziness, um, sinus congestive feeling, acid reflux are all common. Um, they should go away. Uh, the, one of the things I'll just say about the, the half-life of the medications, one um, thing some prescribers might be a little bit more cautious about starting a patient on Cialis right away versus Viagra is with that longer half-life, if they do get uh, some severe side effect with it, you're stuck with it for almost a day and a half um, until it completely wears out of your system. If you take Viagra, you've got a couple hours to kill. So there's not as big of a risk with Viagra, Levitra, or Stendra, whereas there is a bit more of a risk with Cialis. Um, hypotension being the most concerning side effect. Of course, nitrate use is contraindicated, so any um, uh, use of nitroglycerin for chest pain, uh, you shouldn't be using it within 24 hours of the short-acting medications and not within 48 hours of Tadalafil. Uh, be careful with alpha blockers, too. Alpha blockers, of course, orthostatic hypotension, and uh, these drugs can drop blood pressure as well, so. which gets a little bit interesting because you end up seeing people who might take both for uh, BPH, for example, or might take one for erectile dysfunction, one for BPH. So it's just a matter of knowing how the person's going to respond to it. And if they have a history of orthostatic hypotension with their BPH med, you might be a little bit more concerned to prescribe a PDE5 inhibitor. Um, all have really rare reports of hearing loss, interestingly enough. I'm sure of the mechanism on that one. Uh, but it's not, it's not common at all, so it's very unusual. Um, myalgia is common with Tadalafil. 5 to 15% of people who take it report pretty substantial back pain. The other ones don't have that. And of course, you could get the opposite of, well, you could get too much of an effect, I should say, priapism. So um, people could end up with a sustained erection that doesn't go away, and then you end up having to either aspirate the blood out of it with a large needle. Uh, you could inject phenylephrine locally, which is vasoconstrictive, and um, pseudoephedrine could be possibly used at home. So somebody could take a whole bunch of pseudofed, try and get the, the constrictive effects of it, but it's not a guarantee. So I've yeah, this isn't the, there's other causes of priapism, but I've seen a lot of people, not not really seen, I should say. <laughs> I've had a lot of, and I've had a lot of my providers who are like, I got a priapism, what should I do? And usually we inject phenylephrine directly into it and it works reasonably well. So it's better than aspirating it. At least if I were in that situation, that's I think what I've heard. <laughs> I've never been there, so I can't say for sure. <laughs> um, and again, I'll just reiterate that generally consider a shorter half-life drug initially uh, before you go with Cialis. But there's no real, that's just a personal thing. I mean, that's just, I think, common sense, maybe, more or less, not necessarily evidence-based. All right, some other fun facts. So sildenafil is the oldest and most well-studied. Um, it does have more of an effect at delaying refractory time in men than any of the other ones that's so often abused for that reason. Um, and of course, you can buy this all over the internet, or at least versions of it. Uh, but let's talk about the real product. So it's quite expensive. Um, all of them are very similar in cost. So you're usually looking at about $2,000 for a 30-day supply, which works out to be about 60 bucks a tablet. Um, so $10 a tablet is no longer the case. Um, I say do not buy PDE5 inhibitors online because I recommend not buying anything ever online from an untrustworthy source. But I feel like a lot of patients 
will consider this just because of the stigma associated with buying them and because it's embarrassing or whatever. So they'll just risk it and buy something from Mexico that, you know, who knows what's in it. Or they'll go to a Mexican pharmacy. This was actually a picture a friend of mine took while he was on vacation. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so, the, so, so what are some, are there inexpensive alternatives? So interestingly enough, I was thinking about this when I was doing this lecture, because I'm like, why isn't Viagra gone completely generic yet? I, I've been working in pharmacy since I was like 16, and Viagra is the only medication that I can remember, not that I have that great a memory from then, but that was brand name then that's still brand name now. I just don't get why it hasn't gone generic. Apparently there was a lawsuit with some generic manufacturer in 2012, supposed to go generic, and there's some issues. So they got a patent extension until 2020. How that worked out, I have no idea. But um, there should be a generic actually coming out this winter. Uh, that's going to be restricted to one specific manufacturer. So it probably won't be cheap. It'll probably just be like $5 less. But within the next three, four years, we should be seeing cheaper versions of these medications coming out. It's just taking forever to get there. There are some alternatives. The 5 milligram of Tadalafil. So like Cialis comes as a 10 and a 20. Those are the primary uh, erectile dysfunction doses. There's a 5 milligram, which is billed as kind of the once daily, which is used for BPH and really maybe mild erectile dysfunction potentially. And that's about $10 a dose. It's way cheaper. Um, sildenafil is, so you could buy a bunch of Tadalafil 5s and take them and actually be paying less a lot of the time than you would if you took a Tadalafil 20. Oops, excuse me. Um, then there's sildenafil, which uh, comes as a 20 milligram product that was originally designed for pulmonary hypertension that's actually generically available. It's about $20 a dose, so it's a little bit less expensive that way. And um, for the Viagra products, they come as 25, 50, and 100, so there's a little bit different dose in there. But you could get Again, a couple of generic sildenafil 20s and get pretty similar doses with that. Um, so, yeah. So can, as a provider, can you write a prescription? I mean, you have to like provide proof that they need it for BPH and not. Yes. Like, if you have someone come in and they're like, I have erectile dysfunction, you're like, well, I can write you this prescription for how much ever it was a dose, or you can take two of these at ten dollars. Yeah, you, you can write for whatever product for whatever you want. It's just a matter of the, most insurances don't pay for the for erectile dysfunction at all. Some of them will pay for like, like when I used to work retail, it was common. Like some of them might pay for like eight in a month for a certain copay, but they won't pay. Like if you write for 30, it won't pay for 30. So it just depends on what it is. But yeah, you could write for Tadalafil 5 for ED, um, and then you know they might pay for it, they might not. If you write for it for BPH and you're, Prescribing it for ED, that's insurance fraud, and then yep. you could go to jail. Yep. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, but, <laughs> but then again, if you have a BPH patient and you don't want to, and, it, and he has ED too, that could work out nicely in their favor. However, you might have to prove to an insurance company that they've tried generic alternatives for BPH before they want to pay for Tadalafil. So that's where things get complicated. Um, so what if they don't work? There's a, there's some other things that are less appealing than taking a pill for most people. Vacuum erection devices, which come with a prescription. I remember the, the first pharmacy I worked at had one of these in like a back shelf. It was like covered in dust. And I always wondered what it was, and then I asked. I made the mistake of asking. Okay. <laughs> Um, intracavernose injections, so you can actually inject directly into the corpus cavernosa. Um, they're basically a combination of vasodilators and, um, and alpha blockers that keep blood in the, in the um, cavernose. Uh, and then suppositories, there's a urethral suppository that can be injected. It's very small, it's called MUSE, and again, uh, I think very few people would actually use this. Uh, and then there's surgery. Surgery is very risky and isn't proven to do anything at all, so. Yes? Um, for ED, this is just PRN use, correct? Yes, right. You could do that. The, the uh, Cialis advertises that five milligram dose for ED as like a daily use, so it, it it is studied that way, and it's thought to be safe. So you could do daily, but yeah, most of the time you're talking about PRN. All right, and then finally, just a fun slide about male hormonal birth control. There's no options available, as you guys probably know. Um, so the question is, is there an option that's ever going to be available? And probably not for hormonal birth control. So I should say that specifically. There's other areas of men's um, uh, reproductive systems they look at blocking specifically and targeting to, to do. But the problem with this is, is that it's really difficult to, to actively or to, to efficiently or what am I trying to say? Effectively do this by blocking certain areas. So you can suppress testosterone production, but that's going to cause a whole slew of side effects, right? So the question is, how much testosterone or hormone can you suppress 
and decrease spermatogenesis enough where the man's infertile, but at the same time not cause enough side effects. And it's really almost impossible to actually do that. So while female birth control definitely isn't side effect free, um, it's a, in my opinion, and I guess you can call me sexist if you want, but I feel like it's a lot better uh, outlook than what the male alter alternative would be. So take that for what it's worth. Um, also, the formulations are really poor. There's not like a good oral option. So as far as like daily dosing and compliance, there's just a lot of issues with it. However, there are a lot of other areas we could do. So like um, things like the, the structures like the epididymis and the vas deferens, if we can block those various with various products. So like I actually saw some some I don't know, very theoretical product. There's actually like a switch that could get installed in like the scrotum that you could block <laughs> off the epididymis from releasing sperm, which, yeah, yeah. This is the kind of stuff people are researching. Um, and the, the better one probably is something that you would inject that would be like a jelly that would um, actually solidify within the vast deferens, blocking the, the release of sperm. Yeah. So these are products that are on the horizon. Maybe we'll see something like this. Maybe we won't. Yeah, whatever. So, anyway, that's it.